Hey guys, welcome back and thanks for joining me. I'm your host, Sherry. If you can remember back to when I covered the Terrence Woods case, Priceless Pisa, or the Jelani Day case, this is that level of strange. I was shocked when I stumbled upon this case and saw everything that has happened. Daniel's father is a army vet who has made it his life mission to locate his son, and I want to help however little bit I can, even by just getting his story out there. My sources are listed in the description area. All suspects are innocent until proven guilty. This is episode 59, The Disappearance of Daniel Robinson. This story takes place in 2021. Things were just starting to get normal again after the 2020 pandemic. People are back working and most folks have had their vaccination. There was the January 6th takeover of the Capitol by a mob of supporters of Donald Trump. Elon Musk passed Jeff Bezos as the richest man alive. Kim and Kanye announced they were divorcing. R. Kelly was found guilty on nine counts of racketeering and sex trafficking. A cargo ship got stuck in the Suez Canal and the meme lords went out of control. And lastly, the world lost DMX, Prince Philip, Betty White, and Rush Limbaugh. Daniel Robinson is from Columbia, South Carolina. He was born January 14th, 1997. He is 24 years old in 2021, and he had graduated from College of Charleston in South Carolina with honors in 2018. His bachelor degree was for geology. He has a brother and three sisters. His parents are David and Melissa. Daniel worked at a library and a natural history museum, and then he accepted a job in Buckeye, Arizona, which is a hell of a long ways from South Carolina, but he moved out there to work as a geologist. This is what he got his degree for. Daniel is very friendly and loved talking to people and meeting new people. He was an adventurous guy who was smart and was doing great at just 24 years old. Something I never noticed in all the photos of Daniel until it was pointed out, Daniel is missing part of his arm. The lower half of his forearm and his hand are missing. It has been that way since he was born. He wore a prosthetic partial arm until one day he just stopped wearing it. You can see the prosthetic in some early photos, but all the recent photos show him missing his bottom half of his arm. He still managed to play musical instruments. He's known to always see the good and the positive things despite having a physical disability. He made it work and he didn't let his lack of a hand get in the way of his dreams. Daniel loved geology and had a fascinating rock collection. Daniel moved away to Arizona where he got a job at Matrix New World Engineering. He's been with this company for almost three years. He is single and lives in an apartment by himself outside of Phoenix. Now, he does have a sister that lives in Phoenix, so he's not completely alone. They don't live together, but she's way closer than the rest of his family back in South Carolina. Even though he's living across the country from his parents, he is in close contact with them, sometimes multiple times a day. He talks to his mom and dad. They are a very tight family, and he didn't hide anything from his parents, according to them. They were able to discuss things openly with each other. His mom is so sweet in the interviews I've seen with her. His dad is an army vet who did two tours in Afghanistan. This guy is no bullshit. He reminds me of Liam Neeson in the movie Taken. Remember his teenage daughter is kidnapped and he does everything he can to find her? Well, that's David. Daniel was known to drive out to these remote locations, sometimes in the scorching desert for his job. On the morning of June 23, 2021, Daniel gets in his 2017 Jeep Renegade and drives out to this desert for an assignment. There, he is going to meet a man named Ken Elliott, who is a pump technician for a different company. They were going to assess a remote drilling site. This place is in the desert and there's no shade. During the day, the temperatures climb to over 115 degrees, so you got to be careful out there. 
Now, this is the first time Ken and Daniel have ever met each other. I watched interviews with Ken. He seems like the nice old grandpa kind of guy. He's older and been in this field a long time. It's still morning and the scorching heat hasn't kicked in yet. They talk for a few minutes about the weather and the upcoming storm. Ken says Daniel looked distracted the whole time he was talking to him. He kept looking off into the distance in the desert. Ken's just trying to make small talk. These two are complete strangers having just met that morning, and they have to wait for this quick storm to pass before they can begin working. Ken begins to wonder if maybe Daniel is on drugs or has some kind of medical condition because he's acting super sketchy and almost like he can't focus on him. This is completely out of character from the happy-go-lucky, friendly guy most people know Daniel as. He just keeps turning around and looking at the desert behind him. He has a real distant look in his eye. He's also saying things that aren't making sense. He tells Ken, how about we just go to Phoenix so we can rest? Ken says, no, we just got here and we have a job to do here today. I'm not leaving. The rain's going to be over in a few minutes anyway. Ken says Daniel just turns around and walks back over to his Jeep. Ken assumes Daniel is going to sit in there and wait for the storm to pass or grab something out of his car. Instead, Daniel starts the car and puts on his seatbelt. He gives a slight wave to Ken and then he drives off. Ken calls his coworkers and tells them the young man he was supposed to work with just left abruptly and maybe he was just not feeling well. He was only on the job site for 15 minutes before leaving. A few hours later, the employer calls Ken and says no one can locate Daniel since he left you this morning. He gets in his vehicle and he follows the path of the tire tracks that it's showing Daniel took. The rain quickly passed so you can see the tire tracks in the dirt. Ken was upset when he gets to a T-junction because he expects to see Daniel's tire tracks turn left, which would take him back to Phoenix. Instead, his tire tracks turned right, which would only lead him further out in the desert. Like, this is just a vast terrain of desert. He has no business being out there. Even though Daniel is a great outdoorsman, what is he doing out there? Why did he leave his job site? What was he so distracted by? Ken notifies the police about these tire tracks and the, and they search the whole area. This is the desert, so it's much easier to see than if there were if they were searching in the woods. They find no sign of Daniel or his Jeep. They did these helicopter searches in the area and still can't locate Daniel. Helicopter in the desert seems like the easiest way to find someone, but there's no sign of him anywhere. Daniel's employer called his sister, who lives in Phoenix, and explained what happened. She calls her parents, and David, who is Daniel's father, is sitting on the back porch when he is told Daniel may be missing. Daniel took off, and no one knows where he went. Again, even though they are across the country, Daniel talked to them daily, so this was really strange. At first, he call, just calls Daniel's phone. He knows Daniel will answer for him no matter what, but it just rings and then goes to voicemail. He keeps calling, and it's ringing and going to voicemail. He asked Daniel's sister to go over to his apartment and see if he's home. She's the only person over there. You know, they're back in South Carolina. She goes over there, and his Jeep isn't sitting out front, and no one is answering the door. She doesn't have a key, so she can't get in and look around. That evening, Daniel's father files a missing persons report. He drives 2,000 miles to Arizona, where he will assist with looking for his son. David said the whole way there, he was just trying to go as fast as he could, even wishing at times that he would have just taken a plane so he could get there faster. Most of the time when a person is reported missing, they usually resolve themselves. Most times they are found within 12 to 24 hours. That wouldn't be the case for Daniel, though. David feels like a lot of us would feel. I know I would. That is, if your child was missing, no one could do as good of a job searching than you yourself. Besides the Buckeye police are a small police station with limited resources, I'm not knocking them, but they don't have all the experience and equipment that, say, the NYPD would have or other major cities. This is a police station in the middle of a small town in Arizona. The biggest city around is Phoenix. All we know is that Daniel showed up at the job. Unlike his normal bubbly self, he acted strange and distant. He stayed for 15 minutes and left without, ex without explanation. The tire marks show he didn't go the way that would have taken him back into town. Instead, he went the way that would have taken him deeper into the desert. 
The next day, which is June 24th, Daniel has been missing for around 24 hours. Police attempt to locate Daniel's vehicle by using Uconnect. Uconnect is a system in newer models of Jeeps and other Chrysler vehicles. It allows you to remote start the vehicle from inside your house. It also helps locate your car from your smartphone, which is good if you're at a concert and forgot where you parked. Anyway, they failed to get any GPS info from the vehicle. They also try to ping his cell phone, but they can't locate it either. The police go inside Daniel's apartment and they don't see him in there. Daniel and his Jeep are nowhere to be found. We're going to discuss leading up to his disappearance and what we know was going on in Daniel's life. According to his parents, he was happy and fine and enthusiastic, friendly, etc. But his mom also said he had trouble making friends once he moved outside of Phoenix. He wanted friends so bad, but just seemed to be lonely. At 24, you should have people to hang out with after work and go to the bar and whatever else 24-year-olds do. But Daniel just couldn't make friends. David tells police his son seemed to be off lately. Something was bothering him and he couldn't get it out of him. I believe Daniel didn't want to disappoint his parents or cause them to worry so it was easier to fake being happy for them. So we learned through interviews with David and Daniel's sister who lives in Arizona that there is a woman he met recently. Daniel had this side gig of delivering groceries for Instacart as a way to earn extra money. He delivered groceries one day and the woman whose name is Caitlin actually invited Daniel into her house because he seemed so friendly. She had one of her girlfriends there with her and he seemed harmless. They exchanged numbers and he went on his way. Caitlin says they texted back and forth for a couple days. They discussed a couple cool podcasts, but then he began showing up to her house unannounced, even telling her he loves her. She asked him to stop showing up without an invite and saying he loves her just days after they after he met her and it was making her uncomfortable. She tells him she does not want to hang out with him anymore and please leave her alone. This isn't normal or acceptable, Caitlin told him. If someone has expressed that you've made them un- uncomfortable, you need to back off. And she's right. One day before Daniel went missing, he sent her a message that said, Do you hate me? She said, I don't hate you, but please leave me alone. His final text message, I'll read verbatim. He says to Caitlin, The world can get better, but I'll have to take all the time I can or we can, whatever to name it. I'll either see you again or never see you again. What Daniel meant in that message, we don't know. Keep in mind that Daniel had just met this woman 10 days before he disappeared, but he told family and friends that he was in love with her. Police instruct David to check his son's social media accounts, see if there's anything on there that may shed some light on this situation. David checks and says Daniel deleted all the photos on his Instagram. His dad says Daniel did mention a woman that he says he was in love with named Caitlin, but she doesn't like him back. He had told his coworkers about her too, saying he barely knew anything about the woman. A waitress at the Waffle House says she saw Daniel in there just two days before he disappeared and he was acting odd. I don't know what she means by odd since there wasn't much info about this encounter. He also texted his sister just two days before he disappeared that he had an emergency. She tried to call him back to find out what was wrong, but he didn't answer. His parents and siblings were able to get into his apartment. They walked in and are shocked to see the condition his apartment was in. Daniel was always very neat and tidy. It was the complete opposite. There are dishes piled up in the sink. The bed isn't made. There's half-eaten bowls of cereal sitting around, clothes strewn around the bedroom. This was completely out of character for Daniel, but they now realize how bad of a state of mind he must have been in. As the days and weeks pass, no one hears from Daniel. His phone makes no calls or text. His Jeep is missing. He is not spotted anywhere or gone back to the apartment. His employer paid his rent so he wouldn't lose it in the event that he turned back up. It's like he simply started that Jeep that morning and vanished. David is still in Arizona searching for his son. He's organizing searches and making pleas to the media to report anything that could help them find Daniel. Police interview family, friends, and coworkers and ask if there's a possibility that Daniel was suicidal or wanting to harm himself. They all said absolutely not. 
He also had no history of drug abuse. He did smoke pot because there were blunts found in his apartment. Plus, everyone knows he smokes pot. Pot has become such a semi-normal thing over the last few years. Now, adults of all ages and backgrounds are smoking it. It wouldn't be until July 19th. This is a few days shy of one month that Daniel went missing. A clue turns up. Daniel's Jeep is found by a rancher. It is crashed and in a ravine. It was less than four miles from the job site. The airbags were deployed and the Jeep is laying on its passenger side. We assume now that he left the job site that morning and crashed his car. Daniel would be in the vehicle deceased and the case would be closed. Nope, this is where things start to get strange. Number one is that this is four weeks since he disappeared. This area was heavily combed by ground searches and helicopter searches for the last few weeks. We're not sure how they missed a crashed blue Jeep Renegade laying on its side in the open like that. As I mentioned earlier, this is the desert. The rancher says that Jeep hasn't been there long. He said his cattle are out there every day, and if his cattle saw this nice, clean piece of machinery, they would have all walked over to it and licked it. Cattle are apparently really curious creatures. David is notified that his son's Jeep has been found. They arrive, and Daniel is not inside that Jeep. The airbags were deployed, and the crash data shows Daniel was wearing a seatbelt at the time. We know Daniel escaped because the sunroof was kicked out. There was no blood found in the inside or outside of the car. However, in the one month since Daniel went missing, there had been three significant rains. There was rain damage inside the Jeep. Even Daniel's hard hat was inside and filled with rainwater, so any blood could have went away by then. We wonder if Daniel maybe had an accident and then wandered off into the desert and died from heat exhaustion or lack of food and water. Remember, temperatures in this Arizona desert are usually more than 100 degrees and there's no shade. But here's the thing. His clothes that he was wearing were found scattered around the Jeep. His boots and wallet were found outside the Jeep. If you look at some of the photos of Daniel's Jeep laying on its side, you'll notice there's an orange safety vest that he wore for work laying out nearby. Daniel had necessary supplies to get help. Inside the car, there was a phone charger and his cell phone, his college ID, his laptop, his backpack, and his apartment keys. But what's worse is that there were two full cases of bottled water found in the trunk. That just baffles my mind. Investigators searched the area for the next 18 hours before collecting all of Daniel's items and having his Jeep towed away. Even though it had been four weeks, David is expecting his son is going to come walking up while they're out there processing this Jeep. He expects Daniel is naked since all of his clothes are laying on the ground. It's heartbreaking to think of David waiting out there for his son to show up. The ravine was searched on the ground by foot and in the air by a helicopter, but they found no other evidence of Daniel. It's on this day that Daniel's family hires their own private investigator named Jeff McGrath to help with the search and try to piece together what happened here. Everything is so bizarre. They need a fresh set of eyes on this one. We'll get into what the private investigator finds soon, soon which is mind-blowing. One month later, there's still airing ground searches taking place. Daniel is on the local media. I don't think this case has reached the national attention yet, but you guys remember what happened in August of 2021? Gabby Petito goes missing. Suddenly, every missing person case was placed on the back burner. Gabby's case got more attention than any missing person case I've ever seen. And I'm not knocking Gabby here. Don't think that. I'm knocking the media. But what this did at the time was missing persons cases involved with people of color were suddenly getting more attention because of all the outrage. We started seeing postings on social media that say, what about Jelani Day? What about Daniel Robinson? These are young black men around the same age as Gabby who went missing around the same time. People began spreading awareness about them. That's how I ever first heard about these two. You can go back a few shows and listen to me discuss Jelani Day's case. David, Daniel's father, says he's not mad at Gabby's family. These folks lost their child. He was just shocked, like most of us were, the amount of tension her case was getting. Gabby's parents even commented that there were thousands of other missing people her age, and they shared their missing persons flyers, too. Rest in peace to Gabby. Her death was horrifying. 
Daniel is suddenly trending online due to all this outrage about people of color that are missing at the same time as Gabby, and his family is thrilled that maybe this will help generate some leads. So the police do not feel there is any foul play in this case. They believe Daniel disappeared on his own, and he very well could have, or they believe this could be a case of suicide. But all the signs indicate that there's more to the story. The cases of water, the clothes, and wallets strewn around his Jeep. I don't get it. I've told you guys countless times, suicide is something, sometimes the end result in these missing persons cases, but not always. If there's no body, there's no note. I think it's lazy to assume suicide in the beginning. Is it possible Daniel was so upset over this girl he just met not giving in to his advances? Of course it is. But there's a whole lot of evidence around that makes it possible for other outcomes to have happened instead. Let's not just focus on one. David starts launching his own searches using volunteers. At this point, David has moved across the country and lives in Arizona now. He does weekly searches for his son using groups of volunteers. They are out there all the time scouring the desert for any sign of Daniel. He started a GoFundMe to assist with the costs. They're on ATVs and spend hours out in the desert. During one of the searches, the team found a human skull. David is excited at the prospect that it could be his son, but he's also worried it could be his son. The skull is tested and found not to belong to Daniel. It also doesn't belong to anyone in the missing person database, so it was likely someone who had no family. Another skull is found and tested, and it was be determined to belong to an animal. So they're not Daniels, but this is good because it shows the team is paying attention and looking thoroughly. David says, quote, From the first day that I arrived in Phoenix, Arizona, I have done more to find my son than the law enforcement agency whose jurisdictional authority covers where he was last seen and where his vehicle was recovered. The Buckeye Police Department investigation has not gathered any evidence on their own. They are unwilling to move beyond their theory, which leads to non-action on their part, end quote. David was able to convince another police department in the area to perform forensic tests on Daniel's phone, but he hasn't been successful in getting anyone in law enforcement to test the entire vehicle, some red paint that was found on a spot on the vehicle, the airbags, the boots, the sunroof hatch, clothing found at the crime scene, and the safety vest. I did read in the police report on the list of evidence that there were swabs done on the steering wheel, the rearview mirror, seatbelt, and the push start button. I don't know whatever became of those swabs or if there was a DNA test performed on them. Now that the police have Daniel's phone, they are able to charge it since it was dead and then they downloaded the data. They found Daniel's last photos were work-related and taken at a different location before he went to the location he disappeared from. It was a photo of some kind of work log and also of a well. The wells in these job sites were all checked, but no sign of Daniel. They also found the text conversation between him and Caitlin and could see Caitlin was telling the truth. Everything she said matched with what was in Daniel's phone. Daniel had moved their conversation to the trash folder, though. I want to talk about this private investigator David hired. His name is Jeff McGrath. He's never done a missing per person case before. Jeff's area of expertise is car accidents. He's the guy your insurance company will hire to figure out who's at fault. He also does car accident reconstructions when the victims are deceased and unable to tell what happened. Jeff can get in there and read data and figure it all out. So Jeff was a little iffy about taking on a missing persons case, but when David showed him the photo of Daniel's vehicle on its side off on the ravine, he knows something isn't right. First, there's the damage to the driver's side of the car. Remember, the car was found on the passenger side. Jeff feels there's way more to the story than what police believe happened. He gets the crash data report, and what he finds leaves us with more questions than answers. He finds the damage to the vehicle doesn't match the terrain it was found laying on its side on. There's a swatch of red paint on the Jeep, which indicates, indicates it made contact with something red, like a car or an object. The data from the black box shows that after the airbags were deployed, the ignition switch turns on 46 more times, which is unheard of. Most times you will only see once or twice, and that's because it records one key turn each time you download the crash box. This was 46 times someone turned the key over after the airbags deployed. It also shows that after the airbags deployed, the car was driven 
another 11 miles. So this means the car was already in a major accident before it was found laying on its side in the ravine. Daniel left the job site that morning. The car was driven around for four hours before having a major accident at 1 o'clock p.m. We don't know what he was doing in those four hours. The Jeep was found in the ravine only four miles from the job site. But again, the markings on the Jeep indicate it was in an accident somewhere else, maybe a suburban or urban area, and then crashed into the ravine in the desert. It showed the driver had his seatbelt on at the time of the crash as well. It's strange to think of someone driving a vehicle with deployed airbags. I didn't even realize it could be done. The speed of the Jeep increased right before the ravine crash. This has some believing that Daniel was trying to jump the ravine but failed, like Dukes of Hazard style driving. This is hard for me to believe. Daniel was a responsible man who doesn't fit the profile of someone who goes jumping ravines. When he landed in the ravine, he turned the ignition switch over 40 plus times to either get the car to start or to use the electric components of the Jeep, like to charge a device or whatever. The Jeep on its side, the sunroof was kicked out. To me, this indicates this man was a fighter who fought to survive. If he was suicidal, he's not going to use all his strength to kick out a sunroof and escape out of the car. Keep in mind that Daniel is escaping one-handed. The police believe the car was only involved in one accident that day. The private investigator says no, there is an additional 11 miles between two crashes. Either someone drove the Jeep for 11 miles with its airbags deployed, or if the Jeep is crashed into the ravine as crash number one, he may have turned the key over and over again trying to get it to start, which explains the 46 attempts. Once he got it started, he was hitting the gas pedal to help turn the vehicle over by spinning the tires, which explains why, the, why there's 11 extra miles on the car. The vehicle wasn't going anywhere. It was just spinning tires, but racking up miles on the odometer. As well, when the car was towed away, it was turned off because the battery was dead, so it's not registering any miles from the crash site to the tow yard. In the text between Caitlin and Daniel, she recommended he check out a podcast. He said he did and he enjoyed it according to a text message he had sent back to her. Well, that podcast was by a person named Eckhart Tolle. I don't know if it's Tolle or Toll. He discusses spiritual awakenings and seeing things in a positive way. And it's like this really deep spiritual podcast that talks about unified consciousness and stuff that's way above my head. Anyway, police suggested Daniel could have been inspired by this and ran off to join a monastery as a monk. There was a monastery about 15 miles from the location of where his Jeep was found. David disputes this, though. He says his son was a scientific kind of guy, not a religious one. As well, Daniel is an intelligent man. If he was going to run off, he would have taken money with him, even if he was leaving everything else behind. I am not 100% sure on this, so don't crucify me in the comments, but if you live in a monastery, I'm not sure police could just enter as they please. At least in movies, they, police have to get permission to enter a religious dwelling like a church. I also think if they go asking monks about Daniel, a vow of silence, which many practice, may complicate things. I think if Daniel was going to join a monastery, they would have found searches on his computer where he would have researched them. Could his disappearance have had something to do with Caitlin? Caitlin was interviewed by police and is not considered a suspect. She told police she met Daniel 10 days before he disappeared. He delivered her Instacart order and she and her girlfriend were drinking at her house. She said he was short and missing an arm, so she thought he was harmless. So she invited him inside for a few minutes where they exchanged numbers. She said looking back in hindsight, she wishes that she wouldn't have done that since maybe he thought that she liked him. Whatever the case, Daniel claims he loved her. She said he was very kind and, you know, she felt bad, but she was not interested in him. She was bothered because she had asked him not to come over unannounced anymore, and he did anyway. She would be out of the house somewhere and get a no notification from her ring camera that someone was at her door, and there's Daniel. He was telling family and friends that he had met two girls while delivering groceries and hooked up with one of them. Maybe she had a friend or relative that did something to Daniel because he wouldn't stop texting her or showing up at her house. 
It's hard to think that's what happened since she never contacted police to say that she was being harassed or this guy is giving me the creeps. She just asked him to stop a few times and then he says he's sorry and that's the end of it. The last message to her bothers me though. The world can get better, but I'll have to take all the time I can or we can, whatever to name it. I'll either see you again or never see you again. What Daniel meant in that message, we don't know. Daniel's bank account has not been touched since he disappeared. His cell phone hasn't been used, but the cell phone is in the possession of the police anyway, so it's not going to be used. His social security number hasn't had any hits. Daniel's dad works endlessly every day to find his son. He still organizes weekly searches with volunteers, and he truly believes his son is alive and they will be reunited one day, which I hope is the case. An article I read by a journalist named Snea Halder states, quote, The picture of Daniel Robinson as a scorned and depressed man did not fit with his father's version of him. He believed that his son was a go-getter, a scientist, who had the potential to change the world because a bright future lay ahead of him, end quote. I believe that Daniel's family is not out of line, that they think Daniel is alive. I don't think they're having false hope. They believe there is probable cause to continue searching, even though there's a possibility Daniel can turn up deceased. They think they're going to find him alive, and I truly hope that they do. David and the volunteers have covered 19,000 acres of land. He does countless interviews and has been featured on a lot of podcasts and true crime programs. It's admirable. He continues to raise money to help fund these searches and equipment needed. I'll post the link in the description area. David has used up all of his retirement money and his savings and now depends on the generosity of donors. I've told you guys before, I lost my son 11 days after his 19th birthday. It's an unimaginable pain. But for parents whose child is missing, I can't fathom what it must be like to wake up every day and not know what happened. Is he dead? Is he alive? Does he need my help right this minute? All this man wants is his son back, and he has looked for him every day, not just his organized desert searches. He's driving through cities and going to homeless shelters and other places. If Daniel is alive, he is 25 years old today. Let's hope Daniel is found and he is able to be with his family again. I went to his website, pleasehelpfinddaniel.com. There, David does weekly updates and Zoom meetings, and people can discuss the case. From what I've seen, he replies to almost everyone. That's it for this week. Take care, and much love to you all.